Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Hello, Russian Hour on air. Today in the program, a postcard from Lada fans in Devon and the story of the Russian people's car yesterday, today and tomorrow. The story that has it all, the good, the bad, the ugly and the most fantastic. Russians imported all kinds of equipment to England in the 1970s, like this Zenit camera, binoculars, telescopes, all kinds of interesting stuff. Most people only know about larders. We're going to look at some. The larder has its origins in the 1960s, with a joint venture between Italy and the Soviet Union. On the banks of the Volga River, the Toglietti Avtovaz plant grew up around an Italian communist town of the same name. These strong but cheap cars were exported to the UK from 1974, selling up to 33,000 units a year until 1997, when a lack of investment meant that the ageing range could not meet new EU emission standards. Each ladder is built to survive, to take on loads, and the roughest of roads, to stop safely. to go smoothly. The Lidas. Tough cars, tame prices. Test one at your nearest Lida dealer tomorrow. We're here at Dunkerswell Airdrome in Devon with Ed and Julian, who are Ziegerlist Lada fans. The airport is historic in its own right, as it was a US Air Force base in the Second World War uh, where the Liberator bombers were based. Now, Ed and Julian are interested in their own historic vehicles, the Lada. Jigurli et la machina! Well, this is my low budget Samara, which uh, I've modified and improved so it can take bales of hay in the back. Uh, modification involved cutting off the rear, as you can see and I've welded in the child's climbing frame as a bit of extra support. Um, the children were faintly unhappy, but I think they had grown out of it by then. Um, when I first drove it with the roof off, it was as wobbly as a cheese sandwich, but this has toughened it up just a reasonable amount, and it's uh, very good for bales of hay, bicycles, and general rubbish in the boot. How's your Volga? Volga's running very well. Uh, very well, of course, is a relative term, that probably means to most people that it's just running. And I see on the side of this larder it says a Lance Soyuz cargo. What's that about? Well, I love Russian names and uh, Russian airlines have n fantastic names. This airline uh, appealed to me because of its name. It's since gone bankrupt, but um, I thought I'd have the stickers made up and stuck on the side of the car. My la da niba. It does deliver me where I want to go. I love the Neva, it does not shiver when it is out in the snow. 
so powerful that it can drive up the wapiti. As I go to go snowboarding down slopes that are tiny, I bought it second hand, but it always gets me there. For both me and my Neva run off. Leaving the high technology of the aeroplanes behind us, we drive to Ed's home for a cup of tea and a chat over his beautiful lagers. My lager Neva does not consider giving up. What I uh, like about this model, Ed, is of course you're flaunting your wealth with it because the the 2107 which this is is a little bit more upmarket than than the other larders so um, clearly you're a very su successful and prosperous man people always sit in it and say "Ooh, did you put the seats and you go no they're the originals <laughs> but the the funny thing is it, it, this is one of the early this is one of the really early ones that imported and the British importers removed the chrome grill and threw it in the bin and, and put this ugly grey plastic one on and followed it up with these ugly grey wheel trims and the whole thing just looks like it's been made out of old wheelie bins. What's the history on this one, Ed? Well, this is just the basic 1200 engine, tough as old boots, the, the uh, sort of original design before they started enlarging it. I, um, the one thing that makes me smile on this is um, when you irritated that uh, Ferrari owner by um, mentioning that the only part that can be used on a Ferrari out of a larger engine is the uh, oil filler cap. Probably better quality than a Ferrari one as well. And a hell of a lot cheaper, Ooh, I should think. <laughs> oh. But um, Yes, it's, it's beautifully simple, this, and there's so much space. Well, actually... There's a slight disadvantage, isn't there, to a right-hand drive one? Mm. You've got lots of space here, um, where in Russia you'd have the steering column, but uh, in Britain you've got the manifold, the steering column, the brake cylinders. The brake cylinders. So when you're trying to work on a British uh, right-hand drive larder, everything's all crammed together. You Perhaps. lose a lot of skin. You do. But it, 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 the saying goes that if you haven't drawn blood while working on a larder, you haven't done a good job. <laughs> Russian ladder is back, and here is a sneak peek into its near future. It's called Lada X-Ray. A bit more stylish than the latest Range Rover, don't you think? But more about it later. Lada came a long way since its inception in 1966. And there's a part of its recent history that is as gripping as it is unknown outside of Russia. It is a story of how the people of Tolyati Motor City almost lost everything, and Russia nearly lost its people's car. Contrary to popular belief, Russia's Lada was not just a rebranded Fiat 124. The latter was reworked and adapted for Russia thanks to NAMI, Central Scientific Research Automobile and Automotive Engine Institute. There were 800 changes to what has already been branded as Europe's best car in 1966 at the Paris Auto Show. Aluminium brake drums were added to the rear and the original Fiat engine was dropped in favor of a newer design. This new engine had a modern overhead camshaft design which was never used in Fiat cars. The suspension was raised to clear rough Russian roads and the body shell was made from thicker, heavier steel. The first Lada models were equipped with a starting handle in case the battery went flat in Siberian conditions. Hence the slogan, build for Siberia, not for suburbia. Another feature specifically intended to help out in cold conditions was a manual auxiliary fuel pump. In 1966, the new Avdovaz car factory was built on the left bank of Volga River opposite the town of Zhiguli. This site is now the world's third largest motor manufacturing complex, with 90 miles of assembly lines and a shop floor area of 22 million square feet. The factory was built in less than four years by over 45,000 workers, at an estimated cost equivalent to 820 million British pounds. The site included its own hotels, test track, and research and development department. The old town close to the site of the factory was renamed Togliati in honor of the then chairman of the Italian Communist Party. He had played a key role in negotiations which led to the agreement. A new city was built there to house the 650,000 people who would be working in and around and because of the plant. 
After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Avtovaz, remarkably, kept afloat, producing the kind of product which Russians were still eager to buy. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, very few goods produced in post-communist Russia could still remain competitive once the free market was introduced, opening the country to an influx of foreign-made goods, including motor vehicles. Most imported cars in the market, however, were second-hand. They were certainly good for a period of time, but once they broke down, you had to go a long way to get spare parts for them. Russian consumers soon figured out that owning such cars wasn't exactly economical. It still isn't, by the way, at least outside Moscow and St. Petersburg, because in a large country like Russia, driving a used foreign-made car isn't really practical. They're rather difficult to look after as far as maintenance is concerned, but also in terms of wheel suspension, which is strong and durable and suited for Russian roads on larders, whereas foreign-made cars are designed with a very different type of road in mind. Few foreign car manufacturers could match the low prices of ladders. But the Avtovaz and the people of Tolyati nearly lost everything in the 90s. No case represented the corrupt oligarchic system of the 90s better than the story of the tycoon Boris Berezovsky and the Lada. An American citizen of Russian descent, Paul Klebnikov, who devoted his life to Russia's independence from that system, wrote that no man profited more from Russia's slide into the abyss than Boris Berezovsky. Having privatized vast stretches of Russian industry, Berezovsky tried to privatize the state, and when it didn't work out, fled to England, where he successfully claimed political asylum. Although Berezovsky sued the Forbes magazine, which Paul worked with, taking advantage of England's libel law, which favors plaintiffs, Paul continued to publish articles on Berezovsky. The culmination of Paul's work is the book about Berezovsky, Godfather of the Kremlin, the title prompted by his close ties with the Yeltsin family. On the 9th of July 2004, Klebnikov was attacked on a Moscow street late at night by unknown assailants who fired at least nine shots from a slowly moving car. The publisher of Forbes has said that the murder is definitely linked to his journalism. Paul's book is still the most insightful chronicle of Russia in the 1990s, of what many are calling the robbery of the century, with Avtovaz taking center stage. So, according to Paul, it was in the factory some 600 miles southeast of Moscow that Berezovsky saw his first commercial opportunity. In 1989, Berezovsky approached top Avtovaz managers and proposed a private company to provide computer programming for the factory. In May of that year, Logovaz was established. Almost immediately, Logovaz dropped the business of upgrading industrial computer systems and began selling Avtovaz automobiles. Paul's research showed that formerly it was a 50-50 Russian-Swiss venture, entitled to various tax breaks and to keep part of its profit abroad. But in fact, all but a small percentage of the company, which later nearly bankrupted Avtovaz, belonged to Berezovsky and his partners. The giant auto factory became dependent on a dealership network that was widely known as one of the most criminalized segments of the Russian economy. Dealers were taking the cars as they rolled out off the assembly line and walking off with half of Avtovaz's sales revenues. Paul, who believed in the power of law, was shocked that the law enforcement agents who tried to break the cycle of criminality paralyzing Avtovaz met grisly ends. In 1994, when Radik Yakutyan, head of investigative department of the Samara region prosecutor's office, began looking into organized crime activities related to Avtovaz, he was assassinated. The auto company gained the reputation of the most gangster-ridden of any large Russian company. When police finally decided to sweep on the automaker, they identified no fewer than 65 contract murders involving Avtovaz managers and dealers.
Those who broke the law wound up paying big time at the end of the day. Most of those involved in gang wars eventually came to a tragic end. If you take a walk around a cemetery in Toliati, you will see alleys of mortuary monuments and tombstones of marble, the final abode of those heroes of the 90s. Some of them survived, however, morphing into law-abiding businessmen over time. This is what happened elsewhere as well, as practically any country must have experienced similar periods in history. The same process took about 100 years in the United States, whereas in Russia, thanks to the rapidly evolving world of today, it has taken much less time. It was no surprise to Paul that Berezovsky, helped by his partner, Vadri Patakatishvili, persevered and emerged as the largest dealer of Avtovaz cars. In 1991, he was already selling 10,000 Avtovaz cars annually. Within three years, Logovaz would be selling 45,000 Avtovaz cars a year and grossing revenues of nearly $300 million on this operation alone. With inflation running 20% a month, by delaying payments to Avtovaz, the dealers ended up paying half price for their cars. By 1995, dealers like Logovaz would owe the automaker $1.2 billion, one third of the company's total sales. Why did Avtovaz continue to sell to the gangster dealers who were bankrupting the economy? According to Paul Klebnikov, the stick was a fear of getting murdered and the carrot was payment under the table for Avtovaz managers. The epitome of those times is an interesting exhibit in the Vaz Museum in Togliati, Lada 110 of 1994, one of the least successful Lada models with the look which, one may say, hints at the time of troubles. It was introduced to the then President Yeltsin and the members of his government in the Kremlin. The President drove a few hundred meters in it and then crashed while driving in reverse. Vaz decided to keep this car unrepaired as a reminder of the days when the whole country seems to have gone astray. One of the most famous cash investment funds being peddled to Russian citizens in the 1990s, which was depicted in Paul's book, was Berezovsky's brainchild called AVA, the All-Russian Automobile Alliance. AVA, it was claimed, will provide Russians with a new people's car, as if Lada was not just that. Convinced by the advertising campaign that the new plant would be built, more than 100,000 Russians bought a total of $50 million worth of AVA certificates. But there was not money to even begin construction. Investors began to suspect that AVA was a sham. The people's car was dead. For Berezovsky, AVA was a great success. At least part of the AVA money was used to buy a 34% stake in Avtovaz. Another Berezovsky scheme, described by Paul, was called re-export. Export contracts typically stipulated an even lower price for ladders than domestic dealership contracts and granted an even longer grace period for dealership payments, up to one year. Berezovsky actually sold his cars in Russia, but their re-export status allowed him to receive the foreign currency. The cars remained in the country but their documents showed them to be exported and then imported back to Russia. Paul was shocked to discover that while Avtovaz dealers like Berezovsky were becoming immensely wealthy, the automaker sank deeper into debt. The company was so short of cash that it could not pay its taxes, electricity bills or workers' salaries. In the summer of 1995, Avtovaz had finally decided to liberate itself from Berezovsky's grip and the contract that had given Berezovsky his first fortune was torn up. By then, the tycoon had already found another lucrative cash cow, Aeroflot, which he nearly bankrupted as well, but that is another story. One may say Paul's book is outdated, a matter of long standing, but Forbes magazine has just urged British authorities to take action against Boris Berezovsky in relation to comments made in court that appear to be at odds with a statement he gave in a libel action against Forbes and Paul a decade ago. In America, such conduct would be a serious matter. We hope that the English authorities will treat it similarly, said the publisher. So, as one of the recent reports on the matter suggests, quote, the British society is finally waking up to the fact that amongst the so-called refugees we harboured, Boris Berezovsky and his former partner Badri Patarkatishvili 
The two main heads of the Lernaean Hydra of the criminal underworld, which looted Russia in the 1990s. Every day, we learn new words. Thanks to a recent high court battle, we learned a new Russian word, Krisha. Krisha means roof, but in the language of the Mafia means protection. While Boris Berezovsky was then involved as political roof, having been a close ally of the Yeltsin family, his Georgia-born partner, Badri Patakachishvili, provided the criminal Krisha, criminal protection. But regardless of the terminology of the political side of the operation worked together with the criminal side, it was merely a division of labor, unquote. Just recently, a Moscow court has ordered Boris Berezovsky, who now lives in the UK, to pay almost 1 billion rubles in a lawsuit filed by the Samara region government in connection with Avtovaz. According to the plaintiff, Berezovsky used his Logovaz car dealership in 1994 to defraud the state-controlled Avtovaz car plant of several thousand cars. Berezovsky has rejected the court's decision and said it was unlikely to be enforced. Eventually, Paul Klebnikov wrote, Russia's era of self-destruction will draw to a close and the nation will undertake the difficult task of rebuilding. Vladimir Putin may well be the man to accomplish this task, but first, he will have to deal with the corruption and crony capitalism epitomized by Boris Berezovsky. There are certain situations that produce monsters. Of course, it's the sleep of reason that produces monsters in the first place. Appropriate conclusions were made from the experience at the end of the day. And by now, we've gone a very long way in terms of straightening out corporate ownership. One of the tasks that Avtovas has always considered a priority is making the company more attractive for investment. Following the global crisis of 2008-2009, Igor Kamarov was appointed president of Avtovas. He's been in charge of the company for three years now, marking the end of his third year in this position just recently on August 29, 2012. We have managed to accomplish our designated tasks, along with many other objectives. We have successfully implemented a crisis management program that saved the factory. We also received substantial support from the government, just like happened in other economies that assisted their automotive industries. Take the United States, where the stimulus package was several times larger than in Russia. The same was done in Europe by the Germans and the French, to name a few. This is a reasonable thing to do because motor vehicle production is the backbone of manufacturing. Automotive industry has the longest production chain, wherein all other industries are represented through their input. Therefore, if you want to have a self-sufficient economy, you need to have a car industry of your own, and supporting it is a natural priority. This is another exhibit in the Vaz Museum. Lada Kalina, tested by Vladimir Putin in 2010, who drove it for about 2,000 kilometers and left his autograph on the bonnet as a sign of approval and personal determination to support the Russian people's car. Avtovaz survived the Great Mob War and the oligarchic system of the 90s and is driving into a new era, now a part of the alliance between Renault-Nissan and the Russian state corporation Rostechnologie. Russia's motor city is back on track and is picking up speed as it opens a new, modern assembly line and comes up with new models. Lada Granta is our new classic. We had intended and have successfully managed to accommodate an innovative vehicle with an affordable price and a good package of options that we provide for that money. This is what has propelled this vehicle into a leading brand by sales. People are still lining up to buy our car, even though it's been on sale since the end of last year. As far as exports are concerned, our main sales market is CIS countries, primarily Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Belarusia, etc. On top of that, we also market modest amounts of our vehicles in Western Europe, Latin America and Africa, where we have set up an assembly business. One factor that is very important for us is time. There is no time for us to waste, so we'll do our best to keep up and move on. And the developments we presently see give us confidence. The new Avtovaz assembly line looks very 21st century. Machines producing other machines. 
But these are not scenes from the Terminator movie. These robots are tough, but tame. Like the cars they help to assemble, you can almost physically feel Russian technological DNA here. It was in 1738 when the Russian engineer Andrei Nartov built the world's first machine tool with a mechanical carriage and a set of replaceable toothed wheels, one can say, world's first robot. A similar tool was built in Britain only in the 1790s by the British engineer Henry Maudsley. What goes around comes around, and Russia and Britain continue to complement each other in science, industry and technology. Now Lada's design director is an Englishman, Steve Matten. We met him at the recent Moscow Automotive Exhibition, where Lada X-Ray was the star of the show. Steve, welcome on the program, welcome to the Russian Hour. Uh, can you please tell us about yourself briefly, about your background? Yeah, sure. Um, I studied uh, Coventry University, automotive design, back in the mid-80s. Uh, from there I moved on to Mercedes-Benz, where I spent nearly 18 years designing cars for them, working my way up different management levels. Then um, back in 2005 I moved to Sweden to take over the role as Volvo's design director. And then last year in October, I came here now to Russia to work for Avtovaz and the Lada brand as their design director and try and, let's say, help turn around the Russian car industry. So. Well, this is obviously a concept car. It shows us sort of the roadmap for Lada the way you see it. But can I have a sneak preview of uh, what to expect from Lada design wise? And uh, sort of, will you take on board Lada's Russian DNA? Will it have any sort of Russian sort of overtone in its design? Well, first, let me say a little, uh, let's say, three main points for this concept car why we actually did it, because I think that's very relevant for everyone to know. Firstly, you know, the company is expanding. We have um, a new product uh, offensive with new product uh, products coming out in the future, both in SUV and crossover segmentation, um, as well as at some point continuing on with a 4x4 product that we have. So it's very important with these new products coming in the future to actually show that the company is actually opening up its portfolio and this vehicle sort of represents that whole segmentation. Secondly, um, it starts to incorporate a lot of the design features, the DNA that's actually ongoing on other projects. So the other projects have actually inspired this car. Simultaneously, the execution on this car of those elements is actually inspiring the projects today. Um, thirdly, the most important aspect is we're previewing with this uh, concept, the uh, X-ray concept, the new face of Lada. So you can expect as from 2015, when you'll start seeing some of this new design language appearing, also the new face of Lada appearing. Of course, this car has picked up on some cues from the past, like the very, let's say, architectural shoulder, which you can say is very similar to the 4x4. The fact that we have the indicators sitting up high above the headlamps integrated into the hood, clamshell hood, um, the three-door configuration of this car, which is quite abnormal, let's say, for a, a crossover. But I wanted to pick up on some of the heritage then from the 4x4 to put that into the concept. So there are little elements here and there which we're sort of evaluating and incorporating, but it's trying to make a fresh start as well for the brand. Great. Uh, talking about the fresh start, uh, some say that Daniel Craig, the new James Bond, is uh, a sort of Putin's lookalike. Uh, can you imagine him, well, in a few years driving one of these, driving a Russian ladder? I think anything is possible. I mean, we've had a lot of comments in the press and, you know, this car being uh, compared to other brands um, as far as the design execution, as far as proportion, styling and things. You know, we have huge uh, potential, though, to actually grow. That's one of the reasons why we have these new products coming. The story of Tolyaty, the Russian motor city on Volga River, continues. Like the river, the city and the car itself, Lada, like the soul of the Russian people, seems to have an incredible capacity for survival and self-healing. There's a mystical human element in Lada's character, something that cannot be measured or quantified. Just as the famous Russian song says, there flows the river Volga, without edge or end. Редактор 
любовь спелый среди снега. 